My name is Anna Mitchell. I'm the local history librarian here at the Wayne County Public Library. Today is Wednesday, March 1st, 2023, and I have the opportunity to interview Ken Nunn. On behalf of the Wayne County Public Library, to record your personal recollections. Um, this interview is invaluable for preserving the history of Wayne County. Is it okay if I have, if I record this interview? Do I have your permission? Yes, it is. Great. All right, so first, just to start, just tell me a little bit about you, um, a little bit about your family, and, you know, the or origins of Ken Nunn. Well, you opened up a big question there. Uh, I was born in 1949 in Wayne County. A very unique situation. Uh, there were only two adoptions in Wayne County in 1949. In those days, you normally sent adopted uh, children out to other counties. For some reason, I was left in Wayne County. And of course, I've done all that research uh, years back uh, to find out my other family, so to speak. But uh, on the nun side of it, uh, I was adopted uh, by a couple that were pretty uh, late in life having children, couldn't have children, so I was an only child. So I was uh, brought into Goldsboro, uh, raised uh, right down here on 1200 Mimosa Street, right down from the library, and uh, had a very, I would say, normal life. Uh, lots of uh, neighborhood friends, that kind of thing. I went to, uh, my parents were uh, First Baptist Church folks, became charter members of the Madison Avenue Baptist Church. So my first years in church were in the hallways of First Baptist Church. So uh, certainly a neighborhood uh, person, you know, even to where the library is at today. But uh, there again, came up through the public schools, uh, Edgewood School, Walnut Street School, uh, right into Goldsboro Junior High School. And of course, being a big person, <laughs> I wasn't uh, able to play organized sports, uh, boys club, mm -hmm. because there were weight limits. Okay. So all of my sports were gathered uh, on the field of hard knocks, you know, around schoolhouses or people's backyards or places like that. So uh, that got me up on the big picture up through age 18. I graduated from Goldsboro High School in 1967 and basically moved on. I have never lived in Wayne County since then. But of course, lots of friends left behind that did, lots of classmates. And so uh, over the, the years, uh, I have been the person that uh, the class of 1967 has turned to, uh, to keep up with everybody. Uh, for some reason, they thought uh, since I was a postmaster, uh, my career was postal service, I was postmaster for 40 years. And so I guess everybody thought I could always find someone. And so today they think, well, no, it was more than that. He probably worked for the CIA or something because uh, out of 400 uh, classmates, right now I know where basically 92% of them are after 56 years. So that's kept me busy. But on uh, back to today's topic, uh, from a football standpoint, uh, I've done the same thing. Uh, there were... In our junior and senior year, there were 71 uh, players, uh, coaches, cheerleaders, managers, and I can tell you where all 71 of them are today, 56 years later. So, Goldsboro has always been a part of my life. Just since 18, I haven't been here, and I'm, I was turned 74 uh, last Thursday, February 23rd. Happy belated birthday. Yeah, so uh, I've had a, a, a very few close friends uh, that have always been here. Uh, one recently passed away, Mike DeGrishi, uh, stayed here all these years. So I've always had contacts. Uh, of course, that leads to reunions, that leads to knowing where everybody's at. Uh, of course, you always have the, the sadness of deceased uh, classmates, teammates, coaches, etc. So I have been in that mix all this time. So that's what led me here and to Marty. Uh, it seemed that uh, the library was trying to reach out and establish a local history program and, and really, from what I'm seeing here, you know, had great success. Uh, but I started coming here, working with him. Uh, he was very interested, especially from this nobody knows what 
where the earthquake came from, but we'll get into that. Um, and so I spent a lot of time, a lot of hours here. At, you know, I retired in 2008, so obviously I had the time to do it. So I would come up, and he'd turn me loose. Uh, you know, I'd ramble and ask, and uh, sometimes I'd end up out at the News Argus. You know, at that time, they still had some microfish out there, didn't have them. I guess you've got them all here by now. So I spent a lot of time between this room, that room, and, and the News Argus. And, of course, around town uh, through friends, you know, just trying to deal with uh, different families that might know something. Uh, I think Sherwood Williford is a well-known local uh, uh, author, or reporter, whatever his title is. So it got to the point that nobody knows. But we'll get into that, too. Sure. So I, that's a lot about me and, and a lot about what we'll talk about today. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a Goldsboro guy. You know, sure. that's the bottom line. So you said you, you haven't lived here. Where do you live now? I am in Swansboro. Uh, my last uh, post office was at Emerald Isle. Okay. So I ret actually retired officially as postmaster at Emerald Isle. And I've been in uh, seven other post offices, seven, seven other postmaster jobs, east and west, Greensboro, you know, Salisbury, Winston, uh, down east, uh, Sneeds Ferry. I mean, it's, uh, I traveled around quite a bit for the postal service. Um, so, yeah, let's just jump right into the, the, the history of Goldsboro High School. You said you're a graduate of 1967? 1967. 1967. Um, the history of the earthquakes, I'm very interested in that. Um, <laughs> you said you were an accomplished athlete at Goldsboro. Well, there again, back to the bigness of things. Sure. Uh, coming up through junior high school, uh, I played basketball, played football, same way in high school. Uh, I guess for my time, even though today I'd be considered small, but at that time I was pretty good size. I was fairly tall. Uh, so my real sport was basketball. And uh, I'm the type that would, uh, can I get in the gym? And they'd say, well, look, I'll leave this window open for you. You can come anytime, turn the lights on, you know. In fact, my, my, one of my biggest uh, disappointments, I, my first bicycle, someone stole it beside the junior high school gym over here because I was inside in the dark of night practicing basketball and it climbed in the window that the coach always left open for me. And when I came out, my bicycle was gone. <laughs> so, so, you know, yeah, I was a gym rat. Uh, I came up with the uh, Turlingtons, uh, Jackie, Dickie, Lloyd, uh, David Odom. Uh, David Odom, uh, I guess, kindness of his heart or maybe a little bit of skill would all there was always a, a a summer league at the community building and these were college guys from around the county in goldsboro you know maybe playing at guilford and some of these other small schools and he invited me to come and be on the team so you know that was big sure that was big so my highlight there i guess was uh, uh a game that i finally won you know last minute free throw uh, i made it and uh, off and running. At that time, never knew that David Odom would, of course, be involved in the coaching mm -hmm. aspect some years later. So, uh, yeah, I was uh, pretty active there. Came up uh, on the football side of it. Uh, people in those days from Goldsboro, you know, we were just beaten down. I mean, our team was, you know, we'd have two and eight season. I mean, it just wasn't a successful football town. Not to say that it wasn't supported, uh, but it just, I don't know, uh, maybe it's number of students, uh, which equals number of athletes available. I, I don't know. But uh, my best success, of course, is, is always at the end, like it is when I was a senior. I uh, made uh, second team uh, 4A. And at that time, when you said 4A school, that meant something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and there's only seven, eight schools uh, from, from Durham to the coast that are 4A. I mean, think about that today. Yeah. There's probably, what, 15 or 20 just in Wake County mm -hmm. that are 4A. So you have to put everything in proportion to say, you know, what success you had didn't sound very big then, but look at it what it would have been today with the numbers and, and the, the quality and the skill level of today. So because uh, a couple of guys on the team did better than I did, uh, you know, Richard Thornton, uh, Ron Tingen, 
uh, played in the Shrine Bowl, played in the East-West uh, All-Star game. Uh, I played in the North-South game. It was uh, run by the JCs, uh, Lake Waccamaw. They had an orphanage there. And it was over at East Carolina, and, you know, it was a big deal. So football became my sport, but basketball was always in my heart. And so uh, things changed in my junior year. Uh, I was the up and rising star off of the JV team that, you know, should have stepped right into a, a junior senior basketball career. That didn't happen. Uh, you know, I, I got, I guess, influenced by all the football guys over here to say, well, you know, you need to be wrestling. You know, you need to be developing your strength. You know, you uh, you can't. Uh, then you didn't transition from from one sport to the other. It's most unusual for somebody to play two sports. But uh, I gave up basketball, and I had been to Campbell College basketball uh, camps as a kid. You know, I'm mean, like I said, gym rat the whole bit. But I gave it up for football. So, junior senior year, uh, football was everything. You know, and uh, we had, as we'll talk about here, we, we had some success and things did change for Goldsboro uh, and as far as the football program. Uh, even those few years, Goldsboro still didn't do much in other sports. Now, George Whitfield, Coach George Whitfield, uh, certainly kept the baseball uh, alive and well. But basketball was never much. And, of course, all prior to us, football was just, you know, we were at the bottom every year. In fact, my junior year, we were picked last in the conference. But there again, that's the past. So we'll we'll talk about the future here. Sure. Um, you seem to have a fond recollection of your days at Goldsboro High School. Do you have a favorite memory or a favorite game that you, that you played? Well, I'll put it in, in, in categories. Uh, because of the, the, the limited number of 4A schools, there was always Durham, Raleigh, and Fayetteville. Well, they traveled. It took two or three buses to bring, you know, their team. Mm -hmm. We would have 25 guys. So uh, over these two years, uh, seven and three records, those were the only three schools we ever lost to. And those were number one, number two, number three in the state one of them was state champion both of these years that I was junior senior. So those were highlights because, as you'll see in some of these notes, if we get to them today, uh, we were ahead in all three of these games, uh, team against these teams both years at halftime. But there again, strength in numbers, injuries, you know, uh, things that just are beyond effort. Uh, they're beyond conditioning. Um, we were playing against All-American quarterbacks. I mean, you know, there were a lot of variables there. And even though we lost those three games each year, well, that's still a highlight. Sure, it's still course. a highlight. Of course. <laughs> um, we, we mentioned, we'll get into um, your time with with the, the game changers aspect of this. You were in school at a very pivotal time in the United States. Um Wayne County Public Schools did not integrate until, officially, until the early 1970s. Seven, seven, 70 is, 70, is, 71, is yeah. the transition year sure. that, that we're aware of. But we did have freedom of choice, and there were students who could choose to go to a school. Um, what are your memories of, of just that experience of having students who were freedom of choice? Well, you got to... <laughs> you got to remember in this first couple of words I wrote down here, when I was coming up, and I think I speak for many, uh, there were two terms that we never really were exposed to, and that's integration and segregation. We didn't apply those terms to school. Mm -hmm. Now, if we went down here to the NC little restaurant that you probably have heard about over the years, a couple of blocks down the street here, there was a back door entrance. But it didn't say black, it didn't, it said uh, colored, or once in a while you would hear the term Negro, you know. But that was, that was a part of our growing up that never really transitioned uh, into, into school. Because it didn't happen, and, and here again, that's kind of the highlight of Gifford. 
none of this happened. Those two terms never were controversial until our sophomore year when we actually went from junior high to Goldsboro High School. So even though things, yes, you know, were going on, the Civil Rights Act had been passed, and, you know, there was all these, you know, down in Alabama and all these other places of, of, of badness, I guess you would say, they really hadn't come into our lives, not as students. And we didn't, we didn't look negatively upon, here again, that situation at the NCQ. You know, that, that was just a part of, of our growing up. There, there wasn't a penalty for that. Uh, I can remember, you know, places like, uh, like the bus station, you know, they would have some separation. You know, there, there were things around town, but it wasn't a, a level of, uh, you know, nervousness. Or uh, in my personal example, uh, my mother was a private duty nurse. Uh, she worked, you know, and we had a, a, a black lady named Bessie Mae Britt. Uh, I guess as early as I could speak, uh, certainly could eat on my, by myself, Bessie Mae was in our home. Uh, when I left at age 18, Bessie Mae was still in our home. You know, my mother retired, but she still, Bessie Mae still came and helped my mother a couple of days a week. So, uh, in the summers, uh, my uncle uh, lived in Eureka. He was a big farmer, hundreds of acres of land. And he had tenant farmers. And yes, the majority were, were black. He had some white, too. But I spent my summers there till I could drive, you know, and then I wanted to be in town. But my point is, you grew up in those years. You grew up in, in the midst of, of, of some division. Uh, that we can look back on. But at that time, it, it wasn't division. It was just life. You just went on. And you didn't go into a place of business. You didn't go into a restaurant. You didn't go to school with some type of uh, tension. Uh, I, I don't ever recall tension. Does that help? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so you mentioned um, Gifford King. Can you just tell us a little bit? about him? Well, Gifford uh, appeared, and I'll have to define that with a little story. In fact, I just talked to Coach Wisenhunt about it uh, a few days ago. We weren't really aware of where they came from, and I say they, base kids. Okay. See, we, there was no exposure to, to the school system as far as the base was concerned until the 10th grade. So up through the 9th grade, you know, they had, uh, was it Meadow Lane and uh, Greenwood? And I mean, you know, there, there was a, an educational structure on the base. So those kids never associated with us. In fact, my best friend, Mike, who's passed away, uh, I didn't even know him until the 10th grade, you know. So uh, the friendships that were made there. Now, I'm not saying there weren't any because maybe the, the boys' club had a team that would play, you know, Greenwood or something like that. But uh, I think in junior high maybe we would play Greenwood the last game of the season. So there was some exposure, but you didn't go to school with them. You know, so there was, it was very limited friendships that were built in, so let's say, grade, you know, one through what? That would be nine. So... Uh, I guess what I'm saying is the black-white situation, the base situation, and now Goldsboro in the middle. And in the 10th grade, that all mixed. That came to pass. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you as best I can about Gifford and his situation. And, and we've talked over the many years with Gifford about this, and he... I won't say I've got all the details, but uh, you want me to go down Gifford's trail right sure. now? Okay. Uh, in those days, of course, there was Dillard High School. Uh, we didn't, and I, when I say we, uh, uh, the white school system, white athletes, white coaches, 
there was certainly, to my knowledge, no contact. There was no scrimmaging. Uh, there was no passing of information. Uh, there was a total black education system, black schools, black athletes, black athletic teams. You know, had absolutely nothing to do with whites. So, and also at that time, here again, back to the base situation, we didn't know how they ended up here uh, because it had been happening for several years, evidently, that in the 10th grade, you would, you know, come from the base. I mean, they'd bustle, whatever, you know, and you would be in the, the class, the sophomore class at Goldsboro High School. But the mechanics of it, uh, it was many years until I, you know, found out that the government was actually paying uh, Wayne County Schools so much per student for them to come from the base and attend uh, a county school. There again, tax dollars keeping up the education system on the base. So it was just something unknown to us. Well, here again, back to black and white. What happened then is, for whatever reason, I, I, in my mind, I can't believe that there wasn't or had not been a black student in a t that, that got to the 10th grade on that base that had never come to Goldsboro High School. But to my knowledge and to everybody I have ever talked to, it had not happened. So... Back to Gifford, uh, and Coach uh, Wisenhunt has verified this. There was absolutely no uh, pre-knowledge that Gifford King was going to come to football practice for the JV team in the 10th grade at Goldsboro High School. There was no uh, politics behind it. There was no school board involvement. Uh, there was no screaming parent uh, at the door. Uh, there was no general on the base that says, you know, this is going to happen. You know, to my personal knowledge, none of that happened. Gifford showed up for football practice. And you can imagine, uh, I, I want to say reaction, but really there wasn't a reaction. He was a football player. And we needed football players. But prior to that, and this is again through Gifford, according to Gifford, when he was in the ninth grade, they actually lived, his, uh, his dad was in the Air Force, they lived off base. So he went to Dillard High School. And we didn't know that for many years. You know, he, 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 has, he has pieced us over 40 years to try to get to the story I'm going to try to tell you today. But uh, by living off base, of course, it wasn't, one, it wasn't convenient, you know, to get him to, to whatever it is, Meadowwood or Parkwood or whatever the school is. It wasn't convenient. Uh, they only had one car, you know, that type of thing. So I don't know that maybe where he had lived before he came here, and I don't know where that was at, what base he was assigned to, that the situation wasn't kind of the same, you know, that if you lived off base, schools were still segregated, you were black, you went to a black school. And I think that's exactly what happened here. Now, when the 10th grade came, I think several things happened. His parents, his family moved on base. So he naturally went uh, under that system. Uh, I think in the ninth grade, he did go to Greenwood. Uh, or Meadow Lane. I, I may have the names wrong there. But anyway, I think he did go in the ninth grade. So in the tenth grade, that would have been just a normal transition for a base kid. You know, it just so happened that Gifford King was an excellent athlete and he was black. And so how does all that fit? So... Uh, I went back and I looked at the annuals, you know, which I've done many times, and I tried to say, well, how, how did he become the first? Well, he was the first male. There was a female, and her name was Brenda Townsend, T-O-W-N-S-E-N-D. 
in the annual. You can go look in the annual right now, and that'll be Gifford King and Brenda Townsend in the sophomore class. Now, to go ahead another couple of years, junior year, senior year, there were other blacks. Uh, when we were juniors, there were four, including Brenda, including Gifford. So from a first standpoint, Gifford's the first male, Brenda's the first female. Now, there were two others in the junior class, and here's the unique part. In the senior class, you would think, okay, Brenda, Gifford, and now I've got four names, but out of those four, there's no Brenda and there's no Gifford. I do not know what has happened to Brenda Townsend because here again, the group that I've been concentrating on is the senior class over all these years. So I do not know what happened to Brenda Townsend. But in Gifford's case, uh, when he came, 10th grade, football practice, he was accepted. There was no question. There was no uh, white athletes turning to coaches saying, what's going on here? Uh, there was no protest. There was no, I'm not going to shower with him. I, yeah, there was none of that. He was, he was just a, a, an excellent football player, fast, strong, uh, had a wonderful throwing arm. You know, he was just what we needed, you know. And when I say we, uh, I, I'll add this in. And I've got the picture of the junior high team in here. But when this group of, of football players got through junior high and, and senior high and got to be seniors, there was 17 of 22 seniors that actually started in junior high school. So we were a pretty tight-knit group. And there again, you've got these few that came in in the 10th grade. Uh, for the most part, we didn't know them, like I explained. And then there was Gifford. And you talking about being different going and playing other schools who had not made this much progress because, and, and you brought up a good point about they had a choice. Mm -hmm. I don't think the choice was being exercised uh, in, in, in the 4A schools. I'm not saying that there weren't, uh, there wasn't a black person going to, to Broughton High School in, in Raleigh. I don't know that for a fact. But from an athletic standpoint, to my knowledge, we didn't play against any blacks, uh, especially in uh, the sophomore year. So there stands Gifford. <clears throat> we don't know where he's come from. We don't know why he's there. We don't know the story. Um, but Gifford more than proved himself. Uh, he, like a lot of us, uh, ended up with some pretty bad knees uh, he's had both knee replacements. I've had one, and I'm facing a partial now. But uh, but he had some injury. But he, um, I, like I said, Gifford was a football player. Uh, he was a student. Uh, I brought you a picture of when he was a, a junior. And I brought you a JV uh, picture. But notice what I, I, I got in yellow there. Not pictured, mm -hmm. Gifford King. Now, why that happened, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But Gifford uh, came into the classroom. Uh, he, was, he was a good student. Uh, he, he, he was just everything that, that we needed. Uh, we needed a strong fullback. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Homer Pike, uh, Seeger's Hardware, but uh, Homer was our uh, our fullback coming out of junior high school. But Homer was an excellent catcher. Well, they convinced Homer he shouldn't play football anymore. So all these things were happening. It never got to a point that Gifford was black. That was just not an issue. So... Uh, that, that got us through the sophomore year. Now, the junior year, uh, Gifford had had some knee problems, but he had played baseball. 
I brought you a picture there. This is the junior varsity baseball team. There's Gifford King. Excellent baseball player. Multiple positions, you know. So um, we got ready to, to go into the junior year. And um, Gifford was still here. Uh, we were not really accustomed to losing kids uh, because their parents got transferred. I'm, I know what was going on. I know summertime, just as it is even today, you know, summertime's a big transition time for the military. Uh, I'm close to Camp Lejeune, and that's what happens down there. So I'm assuming it happens here. But it did not happen on the athletic side. You know, we had not had a, a, a player uh, down in junior high school because they didn't come. We didn't even know them. Now, they were probably being transferred in and out. But it never got to us. So then when in the 10th grade, and, and, and Gifford and Mike DeGrishi and uh, Richard Gaddis, and there, there were several, you know, that came uh, to play with us in the 10th grade that uh, it just didn't dawn on us that they would be leaving or they could leave next year or whatever. And so we went into the junior year uh, with Gifford. Uh, Gifford was, uh, he was going to be the starting fullback. And... I don't know how familiar you are with uh, uh, the training camp. Well, uh, if you ever seen the movie, and I made I made a comment about that. Uh, they made a, a movie about uh, Coach Bear Bryant at Alabama, mm -hmm. and it was called The Junction Boys. And they actually went down to a place in the desert at Texas A and M, and they had uh, this this training camp. Well. Uh, we had been doing the same thing. Uh, the previous coach, before Coach Gerald Wisenhunt, uh, was named Gene Cosby. And he was from Salisbury, up that way. They'd gone to Catawba. Coach uh, Wisenhunt went to Catawba. We had uh, Bob Waller uh, had gone to Catawba. So there was a connection there to Salisbury. And so I don't know how many years prior to us, but, but, but several. I think as long as Gene Cosby was here, maybe six years, somewhere in there. You'd pack up, you know, before the season, and you'd get two school buses. Uh, the, the touchdown club at that time would hire some of the uh, cooks out of the uh, cafeteria, uh, take them. Well, everybody would head for Salisbury to this camp. Uh, it's on Bringle Ferry Road. And so familiar that here about four years ago, I took about 10 or 12 guys up there just to see it again. It had everything that the movie had in it, a dirt hill, uh, a little pond, uh, a little house that everybody stayed in, uh, for better or worse. And I can tell you there were some fights in that little house. But, there again, Gifford, if you want to say, uh, put him on a list of first, uh, he'd certainly be the first black to have experienced that training camp. So... Uh, we packed up, we went to camp, and it was a hard time. Uh, we had guys that would sneak out in the night and uh, get out to the highway and thumb their way back. Uh, we had guys that we'd take, uh, coach, you know, he'd just be gone the next day. And they'd say, well, you know, I took him to the bus station. I mean, it, it, was, it was physically, mentally hard. It was something that they could create away from Goldsboro High School. Uh, you didn't go home at night. You know, your mama didn't uh, nurse you and, and tell you, you know, you're going to be okay. And your daddy said, you got you to gotta stick it out. I mean, you know, all these things that, that parenting have to do with it, you were on your own. So uh, it got pretty hard. It got pretty hard there. Uh, we, we had some, some major disagreements and, uh, and, and some major uh, friendships, I guess you would say, were established. But there again, back to Gifford. Gifford fit. Uh, everything, uh, every everything he did, it just seemed to fit. Uh, here again, he was smart, uh, athletically. He he was uh, physically uh, more than capable. Uh, it, and there was nothing there that reflected upon what we're kind of talking about here in the shadows today. There was no integration, segregation, black, white, uh, uh, just, 
I even use the word hatred sometimes, you know. All these things that I guess uh, we have lived through over all these years, it didn't exist on the football field. And so that made it, I guess, uh, you just kind of rise above it, you know. And, and, and if there were issues when you got back home or if you had uh, maybe been raised in a home where there were racial issues, it all went away on a football field. So uh, in the long term of life, I think it's worth it. And you wouldn't have gotten this uh, anywhere else, I don't think, than, than through the sports. So uh, we had a successful year. We, uh, we were seven and three. And, you know, things, uh, and I've got all that research I'll show you, too. I mean, you know, you hadn't beat, beaten Rocky Mountain in 20 years. I mean, you, things, in fact, this picture was taken the night we beat Rocky Mountain. So there were things going on. Uh, from, from, from a standpoint of Goldsboro and Wayne County that uh, athletically had not happened. You know, this team, for whatever reason, uh, I'm sure you've heard Jack Lee's name, a uh, very prominent writer. I mean, this guy was a walking encyclopedia. But uh, things were happening uh, to this football team that had not previously happened uh, in Goldsboro. A completely new coaching staff. I mean completely 100% new coaching staff. So it was, it was harsh, but it was good. And so uh, Goldsboro was, I think, benefiting from it. You know, the touchdown club was, was very strong. Uh, there again, I, I, I didn't detect any uh, controversy, no, no racial issue there. Dillard had their school. Dillard had their team. Dillard had their league. Dillard was playing other black schools. It had still not come to pass uh, what was going to actually happen in 1970, but we had Gifford. <laughs> so, so Gifford, you know, he – he broke the ice in a lot of different ways. And uh, so Gifford does have a, a long list of first that uh, I don't think anybody, I mean, even as 1970 came to pass, even though they changed to, to, to Cougars, I mean, all these things, uh, bad and good, you know, but I was at a distance here again. I wasn't living here. So I don't really, I, I can't tell you what was going on. All we knew as a, as a team from a distance was that uh, Goldsboro was no longer a 4A school. You know, uh, the, the student population was falling. Uh, yes, for the most part, uh, black athletes, you know, were dominant. Uh, but there again, we had mostly moved on. Gifford had moved on. And, and how Gifford moved on was... Like I said, we had gone to camp. We had suffered through it. The season had begun. We had another successful season, seven and three, as I told you. Same three teams beat us both years back to back. Uh, even though we knocked them down and beat them, the final score is what counts, right? Mm -hmm. So we went through that. Um, I didn't play basketball anymore. Uh, everybody just kind of uh, went on. Because we knew that senior year, things were just going to get better. You know, we were bigger, we were better. Uh, Gifford, we had a few others from the base that had, you know, come along, and so our senior year was was looking really good. And Gifford's dad gets transferred. He gets through the the junior year academically. We're into the very part of the summer, and the next thing we know, Gifford's like. I'm moving to Alaska. I said, oh, my God, <laughs> I'm moving to Alaska. What, what is that all about? You know, But that's just the way th things happen, you know, in the military. And, and for the most part, we weren't familiar with that, you know. And so it was a shock. It was a shock that, that, that Gifford left. And uh, it happened very quickly. I mean, we... We just kind of showed up, you know, to get ready to go to, to Salisbury to this camp, first of August, and it's like no Gifford, and so we. It, it really changed 
the, the makeup of the backfield. I know you're not a football expert, but uh, there was one thing about Goldsboro High School in those years that made us so different, and that's something called a single wing. There was no quarterback under the center. We had fullbacks running. Uh, we had tailbacks. We had names for other positions, and there was nobody under the center. And, in fact, my friend Mike DeGreshi was the first one to uh, what we call blind snap. He could look straight ahead, leaned over, to snap the ball between his legs, not to a quarterback, but to somebody, a tailback, maybe three or four yards behind him, and do it with accuracy, you know, with speed. And so to play Goldsboro was difficult because we were the only school uh, that ran single wing up until Fred Wilson, coach who went on to coach at Elon, coach at Duke, uh, became coach at Fedville, and he put in single wing. So they had to prepare differently for us. And so, but there again, Gifford fit perfectly. You know, he was a perfect running back. He could play fullback. He could pass the ball. He was perfect for the single wing. So that did that did make us different in a way. But uh, going into the senior year, uh, we didn't have Gifford. And it couldn't have come at a worse time. We had, uh, <laughs> we had a sophomore, Randy Edens, uh, and we had uh, Steve Herring, who was a junior, rising age, a junior, and great athletes. But we didn't it, – it was like our whole backfield fell apart. Now, even though we had all these seniors, for the most part, we were all linemen like myself, you know, defensive ends, offensive ends. The, the, the skill positions, as they would call it today, uh, were people like Gifford and uh, Frank Bailey the year before uh, – it just it took that one special skill person to be a tailback under a single wing system to keep it simple for you. And so uh, Gifford's position was key, you know, and all of a sudden what we had built up through a sophomore year, through a junior year, no Gifford in the senior year. So we we were pretty devastated there. We didn't really feel as confident um, going into it. Uh, and so when we went to camp as seniors, it got pretty intense. You know, people in the backfield were fighting for jobs. We had sophomores, uh, you know, that had not ever been to a camp before. Uh, we had a lot of uh, seniors, a lot of leadership. Uh, and so it was, you know, you really didn't know what you had going into the season. But uh, – it worked out, uh, thanks to coaches. Uh, we were always over-conditioned. Uh, you know, when other teams uh, falter in the fourth quarter, it was like the first quarter to us. You know, we, we were just in that good of condition. So even though our skills had to move around a little bit, our, our overall conditioning and ability to play as a team, as a unit, didn't, didn't change any. So uh, Gifford moved on. Uh, in our senior year, I'll finish that out from a football standpoint, uh, we had uh, two, two black uh, guys that had uh, played at Dillard. And here again, back to this choice you mentioned about. Uh, and as you can see, the names that I was telling you about and how they changed just over that three-year period, there was some choice going on. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm very confident of that. But it still was not... Uh, upsetting. It still wasn't uh, dividing anybody. Uh, there was, to my knowledge, there was never uh, an incident uh, during those three years of transition. And, and think about it, when we left there in 67, and I, and I looked down and only see those four uh, names, uh, and I had 405 classmates, uh, it wasn't... <laughs> There wasn't much opportunity for problems because there just wasn't enough opportunity for problems, you know. <laughs> I mean, it, we didn't go 50-50 overnight. We didn't go, uh, you know, they didn't, they didn't march 100 kids from Dillard over to Goldsboro High School. I mean, those, you know, it just, it was choice. 
and and it, and I don't think there was pressure. I mean, if you go and talk to at least four that are in a senior class, and I know where all of them have ended up. You know, a couple of them have passed away, but I don't I don't think uh, confrontation was in the mix. Uh, I think they came, they they studied, they went to class. Uh, we did not have anybody uh, else in the senior class uh, playing uh, athletics. Uh, Gifford was was it. Now I think uh, by maybe my senior year there may have been one black on the JV basketball team, something like that. But uh, but we basically went into the senior year uh, with no blacks on the athletic side of it. And we didn't sense that, uh, I think uh, it'd be safe to say, when we left here in 1967, we, we didn't have any sense of what was going to happen mm -hmm. in 1970. I, I don't think there was any movement or organized, uh, you know, we demand this. You know, I, I, I didn't sense any of that. But there again, I left. Right. I, I can't speak to what actually happened. But... Uh, if it hadn't been for Gifford, uh, and I mean you can you can attach all these first, 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 you know, and that does make him stand out. Uh, that doesn't uh, doesn't put him ahead of anybody else or behind anybody else, but he just happened to be in that right place, right time sure. scenario, and so um, he could have easily disappeared. You know, we kind of. Uh, I think I've got a sheet in here that shows you the numbers. Even today, we don't have but about 15% of that 71 that I was telling you about that actually live in Wayne County. So, so for the most part, uh, after 1967, this group dispersed, you know. Uh, right off the top, I don't know of, of anybody in our class that, you know, stayed behind and became a, County commissioner, or you know, I mean, there was not there was not a political uh, transition there from our class. I'll put it that way. Okay. But uh, you want me to go on about Gifford? Uh, sure, I, I do have a question. Okay. Um, you kind of expressed a sentiment that we've heard over and over. I know we've actually heard Coach Wisenhunt express this that he was what you needed. So there was no tension there what do you think it is about athletics that kind of level that playing field between the races because that's what we've heard over and over is that there was no black or white it was just we're a team and we're doing this together well I, I think yes I think that the team at that time as compared to now and here again I'm going to give you my 2023 opinion uh, team has disappeared and individual has appeared uh, nobody was, uh, you know, on the sidelines making $20 million a year. You know, the, the coach didn't get $10 million a year. You know, the team or the representation of your school, you know. Uh, there were a lot of things that, uh, that I guess you would say were very honorable and important for being called an earthquake, you know. And so uh, it's just a transition. I mean, I, I hear and I read all the time, you know, oh, well, they're just faster, or they're bigger, or they're, you know. I even read an article yesterday on this Ricky Little Near that was the first uh, black that to play football at, at Carolina, you know, and, and uh, he was saying that he was teased about, you know, he wasn't smart enough, you know, to be a quarterback, or did he have to write the plays on his hand? Now, you know, they set fire in front of his dormitory. None of that happened. <laughs> I mean, that just didn't happen in our world. Right. And, and, and Rick Lanier, I think I'm right, was in 1967, you know? And I'm thinking, well, here we were in Goldsboro, uh, to some degree experiencing the same thing. Those things didn't happen. They just didn't happen. Do you recall if the friendship and the bond with Gifford ex extended off of the field and outside of athletics? Yes, because we had, uh, of course... Some guys that, just like Gifford, they lived on the base, mm -hmm. you know. So they would provide him transportation home. They would, you know, you know, so and so's parents were coming. You know, Gifford needed a ride. I mean, there was just this 
help each other, sure. you know, that, that lied outside uh, of, of athletics. He, he never was looked upon differently. Sure. And so I, uh, I, just, I just didn't sense that. Uh, and, and there again, it wasn't because, I mean, you have to say, well, gosh, this only happened over a two-year period, you know, three years maybe at the most. Well, that's true. You know, these other kids that I had, you know, gone to First Presbyterian kindergarten with over here, you know, and had been around in all of my life, but still, there was no friction. There was no event. There was no, um, no reason for there to be uh, a, a dividing line there. Sure. And I think I recall you saying that you're still friends with Gifford now. Sure. Um, so, oh, I see. I've got all kinds of pictures. <laughs> yeah. This, these pictures here were taken at uh, Coach Wisenhunt's mm-hmm. uh, indoctrination, not indoctrination, induction. <laughs> induction. <laughs> Uh, into the North Carolina High School Athletics mm-hmm. uh, Coaches Hall of Fame. Uh, myself, uh, this is uh, let me get where I can see it. This Anthony Gurley uh, uh, went on to be very successful at uh, Guilford College. Uh, it's Ron Tingen. Uh, he played in the Shrine Bowl East West game. Uh, lives up in Indianapolis, Indiana. Charlie Watson, he's a manager. He's out in St. Louis. Talked to him a couple of weeks ago. My friend Mike passed away. Uh, he worked for five different banks, never left Goldsboro. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, Gifford. Gifford went on to be, uh, and I guess I need to pick that story back up in, in Alaska. Right. You want me to pick it up from sure. there? Okay. Uh, when, when Gifford, here again, quick move, had to go, uh, told us where he was going, and then we basically lost contact. Yeah. Now, I would say 10, 15 years went by. And uh, we were like everybody else, you know, trying to get through college, trying to get a job. If we didn't go to college, you know, someone else got married. I mean, there was, there was never get back together. Now, there was friendships, just like with Mike and myself. Uh, there, there were friendships that never were broken. And any time I passed through Goldsboro, you know, it was to see – I'd run across somebody, or we'd call ahead and have a meal, or, you know, that type thing. But Gifford, I can't say there was that kind of uh, contact. Uh, But because they recruited me uh, on this classmate thing to find everybody, you know, and that kind of thing, so they could start having some some reunions with purpose, I guess, I thought, well, I'm going to do the same thing for the football team. So I went back and I looked at junior, senior years. Uh, and here again, when I say both years, because you have cheerleader changes, you had manager changes. We even had one coach change that we hadn't talked about. But anyway, I thought, I'm going to do the same thing there. I'm going to run this dual uh, hunt search. Uh, you know, where are these people? Uh, try to keep up. I hate to say it, but try to keep up with the deceased list, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I mean, I can I can tell you the deceased date of everybody in the class and on the football team. I don't know if I can tell you where they all buried, but still. Uh, so I kind of took that as my project. And so that's where I got back in touch with Gifford. And Gifford at that time was living in, in Oklahoma. And so uh, a couple of years went by maybe closer to the uh, 20-year mark, I guess. Uh, I said, you know, it's time for the football team to come together. If, if the class can have one every five years, you know, the football team. And so we did. And I think the very first one, of course, we met at the school. Uh, the guy that was coaching at the time let us out onto the field in the clubhouse. I mean, you know, we, we tried to reenact. Uh, uh, and so Gifford came. And Gifford had uh, – uh, he had done some, what we thought were kind of strange things. Um, uh, the school he went to in Anchorage, and you understand even that far back, there weren't too many high schools in Alaska. Right. But Gifford, of course, made all conference. Gifford was just running uh, in a rampant over the whole football system. And he got a scholarship to Washington State 
University. And so he had come back to Washington, he left his dad and off, of course, still in the Air Force, still in Alaska. He had come back to Washington State and uh, gone to school and graduated and had actually ended up as a police officer in Los Angeles. Hmm. Now, I think there were some other jobs, some other type careers and so forth. And, uh, and, and here again, this is third party from Gifford. Uh, so I'm not making it up. You know, I, I can't show it to you on paper. But this is all through Gifford back, back to us, uh, the friends. And he says, you know, I, I just couldn't, couldn't find that niche, you know, what, what I uh, was really looking for. But he got married. And the lady that he married, uh, of course, uh, I won't say of course, but is black. But she's a certain percent of the Indian tribe, Indian. So in Oklahoma, as, as here again, as best I can recollect from him, if you are that percentage and you live or want to live on a reservation, you get basically about all the land you want. They just give it to you. And so Gifford, his wife, and I believe is, I don't know if it was his, her brother or her sister, but anyway, another connection to the right percentage of being Indian, uh, now have these two farms uh, in Oklahoma, out from Oklahoma City. Uh, he actually has a house in, o in Oklahoma City, but he has this farm. And I think now has a, a pretty vast uh, network of nephews and nieces and all. And, and Gifford, here again now, uh, just has a little part-time job today, as far as I know, uh, he's a shuttle bus driver for one of the Indian casinos. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he'll call me. I mean, just out of clear blue, you know, he'll call me and he'll say, oh, you're not going to believe what happened today. You know, he says, they had me driving them. And he's talking about people to go to the casino. All I did was drive them from over here at the casino across the road to a shopping center so they could buy cigarettes. And he said, and we Indians own all that. <laughs> He said, well, we can't sell them across the street. It's some government tax sure. you know, situation. And so we talk. We talk quite a bit. And, and uh, you know, Facebook messaging, that kind of thing. He never misses a, a, a holiday, greeting, uh, a birthday. Uh, as far as I know, he's been to every class reunion uh, since we started having them. And certainly every football reunion. And he even came for this event. I think this event was, I'm going to say about two years ago, but uh, our friend Ron Tingen uh, got a little, you know, Airbnb house in Durham, and we all met there, and uh, so the coach Wisnut and his family and all came, just had a great time, but, uh, and I think I've got that in part of my notes too. I think if, 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 if Gifford were sitting here today, he would say he couldn't give credit enough uh, to Goldsboro. Just, and here again, I think a lot of that is acceptance. A lot of that is, uh, I hate to use that word integration, but you know, it, it, he, he did come together in a time that that was uh, an uneasy time in other parts of the country. But I don't think it was here. Uh, I think the coaches, I think his teachers, I mean, he could, he can quote you the name of some of his teachers and just what they said and what they did and how they helped him. Coaches the same way. I think he would give all those folks just the most credit uh, for the time he was here and how it impacted his life. You know, I mean, how he was able to, because, you know, think about it back to the calendar. When he left here, things only got worse in other places. And what he had to live through and face and so forth to get back into an Oklahoma City where he's been for many years now. So uh, I think he would have nothing but good things to say uh, about Goldsboro and Wayne County. Well, I appreciate you sharing your, your story about Gifford with yeah. us and, and his experience. Um, you mentioned that Goldsboro was always the earthquakes. So I have a question for you because it's something that we had never really considered until we started speaking with people, that in the years after you graduated, there was a change and a, and a shift 
because things were coming together, that even something as seemingly simple as the mascot changed. What was your your perception of that and your response to that as an alum, as a, an earthquake alum, to now it's the Cougars? Cougars. Um, I don't have a bit of problem personally with it. I think the earthquakes uh, stand on their own. You know, I mean, uh, it was a period of time. I mean, come on. What was before the earthquakes? Bow weevils. You know, so so there, there has been transition. So that doesn't, you know, I mean, that tells you right there there's going to be transition going forward. So the fact that, you know, in 1970 they became the Cougars, that, that's here nor there for me. A little side story to that. We had our 50th class reunion, right? And so I'm in charge of that. So I'm getting... You know, there are companies out there that put books together and they, they'll send a photographer to your reunion, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And so uh, I certainly, you know, went down that line and we employed this group. And so they sent back the pictures. And, of course, they want to frame it, you know, and that kind of thing. The class of 1967 had their 50th reunion in 2017. And the symbol of the school was the cougar. Now, that could have been an upsetting moment. Uh, not to say that there was some wonderful uh, symbol of an earthquake, because there wasn't. But for somebody to not know the difference right. and to, uh, on an important document picture such as that, sure. I had a hard time selling that to the class officers and people that had spent money, you know, to buy this product. And I've got it hanging. It, in fact, there were so many of us. It was so well attended. It took two pictures, wow. two eight by tens. I've got it framed, got it on my wall in the office. But it's got the cougar <laughs> in the bottom right. So I don't think, I don't think that uh, had anything to do with it. I think the mystery has been uh, just what my research has, has shown. Nobody knows. Nobody knows in this county, in this state, in this world that I have found that can tell me how they yesterday were bow weevils and today they're earthquakes. That's interesting. The plot thickens. Sure. And uh, if you want me to go into some yeah, of that. Yeah, I would love to hear whatever you'd like to share about the history uh, okay. of the earthquakes. Well, you got to you got to go back to something physical, and that's the building itself. In general terms, the high school had always been on William Street, <clears throat> even back. And I'm talking Civil War. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there are multiple buildings over there. There was a gym over there. That was the high school. Now, the story I've got, I mean, goes back. You know, 1874, Goldsboro High School was established by name, and I can go right on down the list. Uh, the Tarpenter was the name of the uh, the yearbook, uh, how it got to the Gohiska, the Bow Weevil. Uh, Dillard High School was built in 1922. I can tell you how many bricks are in that building over there. And so all that happened, uh, and, and Marty really got interested in it because we couldn't find the answer. You know, and like I said, we went to, to Williford and to the Wheels and the Maxwells. And all, you know, we did everything we could do. I went down to the, to the Board of Education, laid it down there. We went through all the minutes, the notes from the board meetings in 1925, 26, 27. I mean, from the contract phase to the architectural phase, you know, everything. Trying to see what, you know, was it a, uh, was it a school board decision? Was it a, uh, a, a public vote by the students? Uh, did whoever the principal was just wake up this morning and said, the earth shook last night. We're going to be earthquakes tomorrow. Nobody knows. So I just thought, you know, this, this, is, this is just too much here. So I went back, and that's where I started back through the microfish. I thought, I'm going to read every news Argus for at least three years to just see, you know, that, that maybe uh, in 1927 when they actually moved over here to this building, did they have a Did they have a, a student vote? Uh, did they leave William Street as a bow weevil and 
come 10, 12 blocks away as an earthquake. I mean, you know, something had to have happened. Nobody knows. And so uh, I'm not really, uh, I I don't really know how Cougar happened. Mm -hmm. Because that was just not anything I was really interested in. So I don't know whether they had a, like I said, a a vote. I I believe it was a student vote. I would think that would be the best way. So, uh, but as far as the Goldsboro earthquakes and the origin of that term is unknown. And I'm looking at history. I mean, (laughs) we're sitting in a room, you know, with hundreds of years of history, written history, documented history. I mean, think about how many microfiche rolls you got out Mm -hmm. there at uh, Goldsboro News Argus. But doesn't anyone know and can answer that question? Wow, that's really fascinating. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Nobody knew why it that's, changed. That's how, that's how big it is. And, uh, and, and what I did when I brought mine up, uh, you know, when construction began, when the groundbreaking, uh, I mean, I've even got dates when the cornerstone was laid, uh, how much money was spent. But the very first mention was on October 31st, 1927, a headline, Earthquakes Defeat Fremont. Wow. And there was nothing leading up to that at all? Nothing. I mean, all wow. the, all this that I researched, all the, the looking, I mean, I spent probably put together, I spent three or four days in a back room at the Board of Education. Wow. All the time I spent, like I said, well, you know, news artists had their office, but then they had stuff they had given Marty too. You know, so I mean, I'm back and forth. I'm I'm looking at everything. Wow. I go to the the library at the high school. Well, they got all they got is a few annuals, just like you got here. You know, no clue, no clue. Wow. That but now, a mystery. but now, uh, let's go away from the mystery. I just thought about something. When I went to the high school on one of my trips over there. Uh, you know, in those those when I days when I played football, they made a, a sixteen millimeter. They filmed the game. Mm-hmm. In one of their back storerooms, there was a stack of canisters of those old football films. Uh, several other years too, but anyway, I got sixty six, sixty seven converted, mm-hmm. and I got it on CD. Oh, wow. Okay, but yes, uh, back to this. <clears throat> you know, you heard of uh, Mr. Twyford, you know, mm-hmm. the principal and all that stuff. Uh, 28, 29, 30, various articles, still using, still the same coach, uh, still Quake's defeat, 1930. I mean, it, it goes right on. And then, of course, when you got up, uh, I think, I don't know, I think about 47, somewhere along in there, they went to Gohiska, you know, they changed uh, the name of the, the uh, yearbook, that kind of thing. But no answer, no clue. So what I did here is uh, the first year, 1927. All these are quotes or information right out of Goldsboro News Argus. Headlines, uh, people's names. I mean, we got one in here that, uh, uh, you know, had two bad blisters or uh, he's feeling bad. Uh, We had one down here that uh, played with the, uh, uh, what was it? The the orphanage used to be over here. The Odd Fellows. This guy played in the band. <laughs> and so he had to go play in the band before he could go to the football game. Wow. You know, that kind of thing. So I've got, th- this is most interesting here. And uh, then, of course, what I did here is I took our junior year, 66, and our senior year, 67. Mm-hmm. And these are all right out of Lee's limelights. And I don't know if you've ever seen his style of writing. But uh, like a commentary editorial, I mean, he'd have the, uh, you know, the Braves beat whatever, you know. I mean, he had sports, but he had his column, I guess. And the guy was just, I mean, he was a walking uh, encyclopedia. I mean, he knew batting averages, and, 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 and some of this stuff that he came up with is just, you know, where do you even hear this? You know? <laughs> but uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, Jack Lee. In fact, uh, one night after a game, I went back with him to the News Argus 
while he wrote up the article about the game and all this kind of stuff, you know, just to see the environment uh, he worked in. Sure. But what a guy, what a guy. But anyway, I've got those uh, from both years. And then, of course, I did a, uh, just an earthquake trivia, things that, uh, how we matched up, you know, talking about how many mm -hmm. uh, schools there were, uh, who we lost to. Uh, some of us, you know, made all-conference teams, things like that. And uh, this is, you know, this is things that you don't realize. Uh, you know, 17 of your 22 seniors started playing together. We had the best team since 1943. I mean, yeah, these are things that uh, probably, uh, you know, there's the camp I talked about, uh, how we held Billy Lee from Southern Wayne, first win over Rocky Mount, these different things we played. The schools, I told you, All-American quarterback we played against. He had 31 yards mm -hmm. the whole game. But the, the most, I guess you would say, unique thing uh, about those two years to me, uh, I don't know that Goldsboro had ever been ranked, you know, how, how they rank schools. Mm -hmm. Well, if you say ranked in the top 10 uh, 4A schools, think what that would be today. If you took all the 4A schools sure. in North Carolina, well, you know, you were saying the same thing. Basically, you had just squeezed down the population. Right. But for two years, for 20 weeks, you know, 10 games, 10 games, we were the top 10. And that was unheard of. I mean, I don't, I don't know that Goldsburg had ever even been ranked – in the history of the school, you know, I mean, I think way back they had a, a perfect season. But I'm just, I'm saying, since ranking came about, mm -hmm. I, I don't think, I've not found any evidence that says up until 1967, Goldsboro had ever done anything like that in football. Right. Now, I know later on there were some good teams. You know, Coach Wisdom had maybe went to the state playoff mm -hmm. and so forth. I don't, you know, I wasn't living here, so I don't know. It, it, it's, I'm, I'm going to regress here. I, in a couple of my notes, I, I had even highlighted our acceptance of him. Sure. Just what you were asking. Right. <laughs> that seems to be a, a theme. Like, we've spoken to lots of coaches and athletes from different schools in the county. And um, it does seem to be the theme that if you could play ball, that's what mattered. I think Coach Wiz, um, I think it was him who said, I didn't care if they were black, white, yellow, purple. I didn't care. If they could play the sport, that's what mattered to yeah. us. And it's kind of refreshing to hear that um, because I think you could put a negative light on it, but it doesn't seem like that was the case for for many of the, the students that were involved in this time. So. Yeah. And I don't know, I really don't have a handle on what did happen here. From 1970 going forward, uh, like I, I told you previously, I mean, you know, from the outside looking in, we knew things were changing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the structure of the conference, the number of kids in the school. Uh, you'd always hear about this; uh, these private schools are growing, you know, right. or, and, and so forth. But, but none of us—I'll put it that way. I mean, this group that I grew up with, this group that that uh, that Gifford went through with. None of that, none of that had got to us, and and it is troubling. Uh, I know we, we would get together for a reunion. I think 2017, 2018 is the last one we had, and of course they want to take our picture. I believe it or not, we've got a guy in our in our football team who is the official photographer of these shag clubs in Myrtle Beach. He lives in Myrtle Beach. I mean, he puts he puts hundreds of pictures out there. Every shag event there is. Monty Lee is his name. And so Monty came up to reunion. And of course, he's, you know, he's taking pictures. I mean, he's, that's his job, you know. He, he went on, when he left, he actually started taking, uh, when you have school pictures taken. Sure. You know, these guys that would travel around yeah. and take the school. Well, that's Monty. Okay. So he ends up in Myrtle Beach. He's the shagger, you know. But anyway, so Monty comes up. We're going to have a professional, you know, thing. And he did. I mean, he took a picture. But it got time to take the group picture. And there was probably 20 of us there. And he put us in front of that G 
I don't even know if it's still there, but it's on the football field, like a 50-yard line, you know, and it says Goldsboro Cougars. And that's the real first time I think we decided, do we want to have our picture taken? I mean, you know, there was just yeah. something. And, and Gifford, Gifford's one of us. I mean, he's in the sure. picture. You know, he's in the picture. It's, it's not about Gifford. It's not yeah. about black and white. It's not about a, an incident, you right. know. It was just that moment in time that you've got guys uh, that are, you know, 65 years old standing in front of that G and it not really being yeah. what's was it, it. Was it your mascot? It yeah, wasn't it, your yeah it, it's not what's in front of me right here right. today. You know, right. there was, and, it, and, it, and it passed quickly. Took the picture. I mean, we even had the coach that was there at that time. Don't even remember his name. But, I mean, you know, we, we went on with it. Mm-hmm. But there was that moment in time sure. that kind of superseded all this 56 years or whatever it's been, you know, that it, I think it hit every one of us. That something has changed. It's something changed. is different. Not to say it's bad, you know. Not not to say, well, do you remember what happened? You know, such and such. No, nothing like that. But it is it is different. Sure. It is different. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add about um, that you've brought with us here today? Well, I was just going to look over my notes a little bit. Sure. Make sure I've got everything that I know about Gifford, and I think we've talked about that. How he attends everything, and, and Gifford is a. Uh, you know, if you were describing someone as, as a lifetime friend, mm-hmm. you'd put him on your list. Sure. But he's really not because he only came into your life for two or three years. But, you know, he's the kind of person that qualifies. Right. You know, he can hold that title, just like many others here do. But uh, there's, there's just something about his attachment to Goldsboro and our attachment to him. Mm-hmm. I guess that I never really thought about and I don't know why, I know, none of us, to my knowledge, not a coach, not any of us, ever came up over all these years and said, well, you know, Gifford was the first black athlete at Goldsboro High School. I don't think it has ever been spoke mm-hmm. until here in just, you know, recent last few years. And even the last time we were with him, which was here, we talked about that a little bit, you know. And he, you know, I think just naturally that wasn't, that's not a title he would wear. Right. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Not that he would shy away from, from its importance. We so appreciate you sharing your story with us today. Um, just as a, a standard question, why do you think it's important to document Wayne County's history and to get these stories from people? Because if you don't get down to a person like me, you don't get it. <laughs> it goes It goes unknown. Sure. It goes untold. Uh, I'm sure I could sit here and tell you much more, you know, to, to get down to the real bottom of it. But if if uh, if your program, and I, I think back, well, why did they send me an email? But if you had not taken the initiative, you know, and the interest in it, mm-hmm. stories like this would never be told. I mean, when would anybody look back, I mean, even 50 years from today, and say, well, who was the first black athlete <laughs> sure. at Gold's Rise? It, the story would have never been told. Right. So uh, I think it's most important uh, what y'all are doing. And then, like I said, I'm totally impressed with what you've done here with your facility because I have had some previous experience with it, you know. And and bless Mar- Marty's heart. I mean, you know, he, he wanted to do so much, so much. So good. I'm I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very satisfied at what you're doing here in your program and, and everybody will come out. So uh, hopefully my story has helped. Absolutely. We thank you so, so much, Ken. Thank you.